tonight, abortion back at the Supreme Court. We believe women deserve better than not having any care at all. How the landmark case could transform access to the abortion pill across America. Plus... And our response teams are doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse literally as we speak. The shocking bridge collapse in Baltimore. New details as the search and rescue becomes a recovery mission. And ceasefire talks derail in Gaza, the latest on the war between Israel and Hamas. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. The nation's highest court takes up a challenge to at-home abortions. Thanks for joining us for Faith Nation. I'm John Jess. And good evening in Washington. I'm Jenna Browder. With abortion a leading issue this election cycle, justices today heard arguments in what's being called the most important case since the Dobbs decision ending Roe v. Wade. The landmark case centers on access to medication commonly used for at-home abortions, and it highlights the ongoing fight that did not end with the overturning of Roe. And tonight, a look at the arguments inside the court and and protests happening outside. Tara Mergener is at the court with what demonstrators had to say, but we're going to begin tonight with CBN's Lori Johnson, who followed this morning's arguments. Lori, can you talk about what's at the heart of this case? Well, John, the heart of this case is whether the FDA went too far in 2016 and 2021 when it removed safeguards like three in-person doctor visits. And by removing all the doctor visits in person, the pill became available through the mail. Now, the high court is being asked to force the FDA to put back the safeguards and go back to requiring the pill be given only at in-person doctor visits. While the FDA argues removing each doctor visit wouldn't be dangerous, Justice Alito questioned the safety of removing all three. Isn't that obvious that three things that may be innocuous or not excessively dangerous if engaged in by themselves may become very dangerous when they're all done together? And why shouldn't the FDA have addressed that? A group of pro-life doctors pointed out how the FDA itself admitted the drugs harm a significant number of women. The FDA concedes that between 2.9 and 4.6 percent of women will end up in the emergency room. The FDA acknowledges that women are even more likely to need surgical intervention and other medical care without an in-person visit. Even so, some justices appear to give the FDA more weight when it comes to certain decisions. The reality is, even if there is some increase in emergency room visits, the question of when that rises to a sufficient safety risk is up to the FDA, correct? The pro-life doctors countered by arguing the FDA behaved recklessly by removing safeguards, which can put doctors in the position of unwillingly taking part in abortions. FDA's outsourcing of abortion drug harm to respondent doctors forces them to choose between helping a woman with a life-threatening condition and violating their conscience. As to the doctor's conscience concerns, Justice Jackson questioned whether that would warrant limiting the availability of mifepristone. Do we have to also entertain your argument that no one else in the world can have this drug or no one else in America uh, should have this drug in order to protect your clients? So while the justices did seem to consider safety issues associated with mifepristone, overall more comments focused on the question of pro-life doctors suffering, and if so, whether limiting mifepristone would correct the remedy. So the issue of standing, a legal term on whether there's enough reason to bring the case, came up a lot. Some justices believe the doctors who say conscience prevents them from taking part in an abortion have the right to walk away. But the pro-life doctors, however, say that's not necessarily true, especially in the case of an emergency. And they might not even realize they're involved in a botched chemical abortion until it's too late. The Supreme Court is expected to announce its decision in June. All right, Lori Johnson, thank you very much. Well, as arguments were underway inside, crowds gathered outside the Supreme Court, and that's where Tara Mergener joins us from tonight. Tara, what was the scene like earlier? 
Well, Jenna, it's pretty quiet out here tonight, as you can see, but earlier hundreds of protesters, advocates, activists lined the sidewalk and the street in front of the high court. Take a look at this video from just a little bit earlier this afternoon. The turnout was likely a little bit less than anticipated for a case this high profile, but demonstrators from both sides, as I said, did turn out to either support or oppose this case. They had signs, they had megaphones. This gathering mark the first major challenge to abortion access since the court overturned the constitutional right to abortion two years ago. Now, critics of the proposed restrictions at the heart of this legal challenge argue they will endanger women's health by making access to this drug more difficult. They also view the lawsuit as a deliberate tactic to confuse and intimidate. Supporters say, though, the safeguards must be implemented to safeguard women's health. John and Jenna? And so the data, Tara, shows abortions have actually increased since Roe was overturned two years ago, with thousands of voters in states like Ohio who've enshrined abortion to the Constitution in the name of what they call women's health. Uh, Tara, how does that factor into the thinking of some of the pro-life advocates you talk to? Well, right, John, you're absolutely right. There were more than a million abortions in 2023 alone. That is the most since 2012. Four million voters went to the polls in Ohio uh, when that went into effect 30 days later. So pro-life supporters are devastated by this because they believe that this is going to open the door to late-term abortion in Ohio as well as weaken parental consent. But pro-life or pro-choice supporters rather say that th this side is focused on the wrong issue. They never seem concerned about the life of the woman. They never seem, and their argument that, oh, it's dangerous for the woman is absolutely incorrect scientifically. The pill is one of the safest methods of abortion. Now, we did speak to one woman who had a chemical abortion back in 2010. She says her doctors lied to her and that she still suffers from PTSD to this day because of it. The clinic had told me they pressured chemical abortion and said that it would be easier than surgical abortion, but that wasn't true. That was a lie. And the, the important thing to understand is that the, the industry lied to me and did not follow the safeguards that were in place. Now, John and Jen, of course, this issue never gets any easier, no matter the case. A ruling on this case is expected in June. All right, CBN's Tara Merger at the Supreme Court. Thank you so much, Tara. Well, Katie Daniel is the state policy director at SBA Pro-Life America, and she joins us now. Katie, welcome to you. So, Katie, what was your read after today's oral argument? Are you feeling hopeful based on the judge's questions, or do you have any concern on how they might rule? Well, it was a very hot bench. We heard a lot of questions, but we're very hopeful because two lower courts have already found that it's likely the FDA violated federal law and its own rules when it brought these drugs to market and when it subsequently changed the rules on them to say that women don't need to see a doctor um, and they don't need to even see anyone in person. These drugs can be sent through the mail. That's the Biden administration's policy. Two courts have already said that violates federal law, and we hope that the Supreme Court will agree with them. Um, you say, of course, removing safeguards to accessing mifepristone poses a risk to women and their health. Meanwhile, the FDA and many major medical associations argue the drug is safe, having been on the market for decades. Katie, can you explain the gulf in those opposing viewpoints? Well, the FDA stopped collecting any complication data in 2016, and then it subsequently relied on the lack of data to justify its actions, to say, well, no one's telling us women are hurt, so therefore these drugs can be sent through the mail. Uh, women don't need to see a doctor because no one is reporting this to us. But our team at Charlotte Lozier Institute actually looked at state data. Only six states actually collect data on this, and they found during a three-year period from 2020 to 2022, over 1,000 women were seen in emergency rooms related to abortion drug complications. During that same time frame, the FDA reports just 17 of those cases. And that's six states. Imagine if we had these numbers for all 50 states and Washington, D.C. Uh, women aren't getting the full picture of what's going on, and they are not able to make informed decisions. And that is on purpose. The FDA's policies make it impossible to gather this information so that women are told this is safe, and they're not actually told about the real risks. 
Katie, we only have a few seconds left, but I want to squeeze this in if I can. So much of the analysis post oral arguments suggests the judges seem disinclined to restrict access to this chemical abortion medication based on standing, whether the group that challenged the drug actually has the right to sue. Katie, if the court rules that way, permitting the pill's availability based on standing, is there a chance of another attempt by another plaintiff who might be better positioned to challenge the drug? Already three states have joined this case. They want to assert their harms that the state has suffered. Um, states are paying for, to do cleanup for the abortion industry in the emergency room. So we look forward to hearing their arguments as well. Also, many of the women who are outside the court today talking about their harms uh, may want to avail themselves to tort remedies. It was brought up several times in court. Women can sue themselves, and, and we think they should if they've been harmed. All right, Katie Daniel with SBA Pro-Life America. Katie, nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Well, turning now to Baltimore and the aftermath of that shocking early morning bridge collapse. Officials say a container ship lost power and issued a mayday call before ramming into the Francis Scott Key Bridge around 1.30 this morning. The structure crumbled on impact and large pieces tumbled into the river. Workers were on the bridge at the time and several vehicles plunged into the harbor. At least two people were rescued and authorities are working to recover at least six more. We're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. And our prayers are with everyone involved in this terrible accident and all the families, especially those waiting for the news of their loved one right now. For more updates on this developing story, you can go to our website at cbnnews.com. Coming up, an early morning Easter tradition on the National Mall. A look at this weekend's sunrise service at the Lincoln Memorial. Welcome back. The nation's capital is gearing up for an Easter Sunday tradition right on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Each year, thousands head to the National Mall to attend one of the country's largest Easter sunrise services. Praise, worship, and prayer all in celebration of Resurrection Sunday. The interdenominational event has been attracting believers from all over the world for more than 40 years. Indeed, it is a great event. National Community Church is hosting the service this year, and we're joined now by lead pastor Mark Batterson. Pastor Mark, welcome to you. So 44 years in running, can you talk to us about why it's so special to carry on this tradition at the Lincoln Memorial? Yeah, in 1979, Pastor Amos Dodge had a thought that he thought was a thought. What, what if we celebrated the resurrection at the Lincoln Memorial 127 people showed up, and uh, of course, all of these years later, it has become an incredible, uh, not just D.C. tradition, but people make a pilgrimage really from all over the country, all over the world. Uh, I, I think there's no better place to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior than right there mm -hmm. on the National Mall. It really is amazing, the energy that's there, and it, it's just such a beautiful service. Um, Pastor Mark, we know you'll be giving the sermon. How do you prepare for something like this, and do you feel any pregame nerves? <laughs> I love that question. Uh, preachers get butterflies, uh, let me just say it that way. Uh, but he, here's what helps me. That kind of event, I, I pray a little prayer. It's bigger than me, Lord, but it's not bigger mm. than you. And uh, the truth is, it's not about me. Uh, it's not about uh, anybody that gathers there. It's about celebrating uh, Jesus Christ as the, the Son of God and as our risen Savior. So it, it just, it's pure joy when you look out at kind of a sea of people. And Jenna, I see the, they see the sunrise. I see the sun rise on people's faces. And what, what a moment that is to see hope and joy and faith mm. uh, reflected in people's faces. So uh, a few pregame butterflies, but pure joy when, when we're there worshiping the Lord. 
Pastor Mark, as you well know, a lot of us here in our Washington, D.C. Bureau of CBN have a close connection with NCC. Um, and I just want to say, you know, of years of attending, even last year, you can see, even though it's a mega church, you have a pastor's heart to watch you after the service deal with uh, people come up to you one by one. It just showed your heart for people. I just want to ask, though, what did you, you and your team learn from last year's service? And are you going to do anything differently this year in about the minute that we have left? Well, there are some renovations, so we're moving the stage down a little bit closer to the reflecting pool. But, John, I would just say our goal is that everybody who attends feels seen, heard, and loved by God. Uh, they are not just a, a number or a name. They, they have a story that matters to God. And we have seen so many people, divine appointments, um, People uh, come to faith in Christ in in that service. And so we're just anticipating um, uh, a, a joyous moment. There's a supernatural synergy when you celebrate the resurrection with thousands of people and say Christ mm. is risen, cannot wait. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Pastor Mark Batterson of National Community Church, the very best to you and um, best of luck on Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, if you don't live in the D.C. area, it doesn't mean that you have to miss out. You can take part in the Easter sunrise service at the Lincoln Memorial. All you need to do is watch live at 630 Eastern on the CBN News channel, the CBN News YouTube page, or on our website at CBNNews.com. Well, Easter marks one of the busiest days for churches in the lead up to some worship leaders do feel the pressure to perfect their performance. Yeah, it's go time. A new initiative from popular worship band Shane and Shane hopes to help remove some of that stress. Brody Carter has the details. It is possible to find everything you're looking for in Jesus. Of God and King. College friends Shane Barnard and Shane Everett bonded over Jesus and music more than 25 years ago. That partnership has allowed Shane and Shane to reach hearts worldwide through their award-winning albums. In the last few years, they've made it a point to encourage worship leaders to deepen their walk with God. We think the church is the answer, and we think the church is limping. And that's okay. God can use limping people. And so if you're a limping person, come and, and walk with us. Oh, to help Christian musicians in that journey, Shane and Shane created the Worship Initiative, an online resource with lessons and videos focused on the music and growing a relationship with God. We exist to, to do is come along worship leaders and just daily and weekly encourage them with the truth of God's word. And so you go in, you log into the Worship Initiative and you can take all kinds of classes and that's we have interviews with people like Phil Wickham to John Piper. I mean, like, so the gamut is so wide, you know? Oh, oh, praise him. After 10 years in service, the Worship Initiative is now partnering with Glue, an online connection engine and marketplace, expanding their services to some 70,000 churches who use the Glue platform. The average size church is well under 100 people. And so what that means is that church um, may have a limitation on its access to quality resources. Brad Hill, Chief Solutions for... Officer with Glue, says the Worship Initiative is their top seller on their marketplace, celebrating the Easter season with a curated set list and teaching for churches looking to get involved. Because they know that when people drive away from the church after Easter weekend, often people are gonna remember and reflect on the sermon and the music. That, those are the two things that people normally talk about. With Easter on the horizon, what is it that you would speak into local, local pastors, local worship leaders? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind in the midst of all of that is like, man, the pressure is off. Like that, the, the battle is the Lord's. Or you're not secure, or validated because the pastor thinks you did awesome or not awesome. You're secure and validated in Christ. For worship leaders at First United Methodist Church in Graham, Texas, it's been a godsend. Before the worship initiative, I was scrambling for resources. After the worship initiative, I know what to practice. I know how to help other people to practice. Three 
resources and more like it can allow churches to build up its people, ease stress, and focus on celebrating Jesus every day, not just Easter Sunday. Brody Carter, CBN News. I'm ready for worship. <laughs> well, the head of Israel's defense is meeting with his counterpart right here in Washington. What their conversation could mean for a future Rafa invasion, next on Faith Nation. As Israel fights to remove Hamas from Gaza, the head of the terror organization traveled to Iran today for what are being called high-level talks. The meeting comes as the same day as Pentagon discussions between Israel's defense minister and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. There, Yoav Gallant highlighted Iran's central role in regional war. Over the past six months, uh, we have been fighting a war against a, a brutal terror organization, Hamas, which is the ISIS of Gaza. Uh, we also face attacks from seven different fronts. Uh, all led by Iran. Uh, while I sit here in the Pentagon, Hamas leader Ania is meeting with Iranian leadership. Uh, the picture is clear. On Monday, during an uptick of attacks against Israel, the IDF announced it would set up military action on four fronts aside from the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, today, Hamas called for Western countries to end use of eight airdrops in Gaza. That move after reports of 12 Palestinians drowning while trying to collect packages that landed in the sea instead of on land. Well, you may have never heard the name Nicole Shanahan before, but Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants her to be the next vice president of the United States. The independent presidential candidate announced Shanahan as, as his running mate this afternoon. The 38-year-old is a Silicon Valley attorney and investor. She started supporting Kennedy's bid while he was originally running as a Democrat. After switching over to an independent campaign, Shanahan's support continued. She even helped fund an RFK Jr. Super Bowl ad. We'll be back right after the break with more Faith Nation. Finally tonight, a centuries-old tradition for members of the Parisian service industry. That's right. Thousands stood along to catch the sight of 200 waiters and waitresses racing down the streets of Paris. It's called the Corps de Café. Dozens of participants carry a plate with a croissant, coffee, and a glass of water for just over a mile. The goal is to cross the finish line as quickly as possible without running, spilling, or carrying the tray with two <laughs> hands at once. That actually looks quite different. And you, if you're French, you probably have to you know, look put together by the end, too. Yeah, I, no <laughs> doubt. All right, that's going to do it for Faith Nation. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.